here we go. We're going to jump into this is the third week of this series of messages called Tell the World. And I'm so excited to share this message that is on my heart today. Let's pray and then dive in. Jesus, we thank you that you are speaking to us. We thank you that you're using your word to give us clarity and guidance through this season. I pray today that you would uh, be strong in this word into our lives. Our hearts are soft, our ears are open, our hands are ready. We want to do what you're calling us to do. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you're taking notes today, I want you to just write this down. Don't bury the lead. Don't bury the lead. Or, or you could write down this. If you prefer this title, I was kind of going with one of the two. You could write down this. Make your point. In the book of Romans, chapter 1, in verse 16, Paul makes this really strong point. He's speaking, and he's speaking of the gospel, and he says this, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to bring salvation to everyone who believes. He goes, I'm not ashamed of this gospel. I, I think it's the greatest point. It's the point my life is trying to make. The gospel, it's the power to save anyone who believes. Do you know that word gospel? Maybe you've heard it before. Maybe you've used it before. It comes from a Greek word, euangelion, which means good news. The gospel is good news. The message of Jesus is good news. That means, first and foremost, the message of Jesus is good. It's good. The love of God towards us is good. If you have heard a version of the gospel, if you've heard some things about Jesus that have left you feeling like God's mad at you, that's not the gospel. If it's left you feeling like there's a long list of rules that you need to live up to, and if you don't, you fail, that's not the gospel. If it's left you thinking that there's a, a set of rituals that you haven't yet adapted to or grown accustomed to, and because of that, you're on the outside looking in, that's not the gospel. The gospel is good. The gospel is wholesome. The gospel is perfect. It's the grace of God extended towards people. And though they are imperfect, they can live in the full love and embrace of God the Father. Second thing is that the gospel is news. I know that's really, you know, that's so basic to say that good news is both good and news. But think about it. The gospel is news. In other words, the gospel is newsworthy. If you've got a piece of news, it only becomes news when you share it. You know, interestingly, in the world we live in now, in the time we live, news is so rapid. News travels so fast. I think it's one of the reasons why the pandemic that we're in has led to people being reactionary in the same manner at the same time. It's because we all, across different cultures and time zones and continents, can consume the same news at the same time. Well, the, the, the same is true of the gospel. The good news of God's grace is newsworthy. It's worth sharing. It has to be proclaimed. And for some, you've said, you know what, my faith is a private thing. And I suppose the intention with that is good, but the truth of the matter is if you have faith in Jesus, if the faith you have is not just in a set of rituals or, or forms, but if it's actually in the person of Jesus, then it's not just a private thing. It, it has to be shared. It's good news, and it's news that actually is effective anywhere, anytime. Let me show you what I mean. The book of Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Oh man, I love this. I, I am going to warn you today. We're going to jump around to a few parts of Scripture. And in all this, you're going to find yourself saying, Pastor Justin, make your point. It's kind of what the message is about. Here we go. Colossians chapter 1, verse 3. It says this, We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you, because we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your... As, let, me, let me take that one again. We've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all God's people. A faith and a love that springs from a hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you've already heard in the true message of the gospel, the good news. Now catch this, verse 6. That has come to you in the same way the gospel is bearing fruit and is growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. How effective is the gospel? This good news, this good message of God's grace, when it is preached, proclaimed, and understood in all its truth, it bears fruit everywhere. I mean, the gospel is a seed, but it's, it's like this powerful, potent 
seed. It, it's a small little reality that, that the gift of salvation is a free gift from God. But when that is truly understood, it doesn't matter when or where, all around the world, it's bearing fruit. And right now we're in this, this time in the history of humankind where there's a pandemic that spreads across the whole world and with it the terror and the, the thoughts of, of change and the uncertainties of the future. And it's actually being effective all around the world. And at the very same time, I believe the gospel is being effective right now all around the world. As people are questioning their meaning and their purpose and questioning what they can trust and who they can trust and what they're here for and, and what their future looks like. There's never really been a greater time for the gospel to bear fruit in the lives of people. So I want to challenge us, as I believe the scripture would, to be people who would proclaim the gospel, that we wouldn't bury the lead. Now, now for someone you're going, I've heard that saying before. I kind of know what it means, I think, contextually. What exactly do you mean by bury the lead? Well, it's actually a term used in journalism. You see, like, like newspaper journalism. Uh, the thought of a headline is, is such that you should put the most important, most interesting information in the headline. So that a person, before they ever read any of the content, understand what the story is all about. And you have noticed this. If you look at a newspaper article, it starts with the most pertinent information and it works its way down. And by the last paragraph, the information that's usually contained there is not really very significant at all. It's just periphery. It's an interesting little fact. The reason is that uh, back in the day, newspapers were made in such a way that articles were prepared. And, and if a more important article would come, the, the editor of the newspaper would start at the bottom of the, the story and say, I need, to, I need some more space. I need like four more inches on, on page one. And they would go and they would carve off the bottom paragraphs, the least important parts of the story, leaving the headline, which was the main point, and the, the most important supporting information. It's kind of interesting, you know, because I think sometimes when it comes to us sharing our faith, sometimes when it comes to us sharing the, the purpose of our life, this message that God has, has sent to us that His grace is good and that we can be received and that we can be forgiven, I think sometimes we, we have buried that lead so deep within the story that it gets lost. In fact, sometimes we've buried that lead so deeply in the story of our lives that, that people look at a headline and they work their way down and they lose interest. You know, it's kind, it's kind of sad and tragic to think, but, but there's a lot of people saying, I'm going to play this long game with my faith. I'm just going to slowly, you know, keep on doing my life and hopefully one day someone will ask me, where, where my hope comes from, instead of living with the, the main thing being the main thing. A few years ago, Pastor Jennifer and I and our kids, we lived in Los Angeles, and we were part of a team there at a church for a couple of years. And it's interesting, it's, it's you know, just down the I-5, it's on the, in the same time zone, and in many ways we watch the same TV shows, enjoy the same sports, and culture is similar, but there were some really unique differences. One of the differences I found is is in the form of communication. Canadians tend to have this style of communication where when we're trying to make a point, we actually just tell a story. Often the, the points we make and the meetings we have, it's like, well, I was thinking one day about a solution to a problem and it led me to a, a series of different arguments. And we, we work our way towards the end conclusion and at the end of what we're saying, we make our point. Well, Americans communicate so differently. They communicate like newspaper articles. And I found myself in a meeting where someone would say, here's what we're going to do. And they would make their point and wait for people to ask why they thought they should do that. Glad you asked. Here's the most important supporting information. And it was interesting because I found myself in meetings and in gatherings and in conversations, understanding that, that the point I was trying to get to was being lost. Why? Because I was burying the lead. In fact, I was in a, a meeting once and I was trying to prove the conclusion that I was about to come to and, and hoping that I could crescendo with the end of the meeting, my, my big conclusion. And someone said, hey, I don't, can I stop you for just a minute, Pastor Justin? Can, can you just make your point? Isn't that interesting? What they were saying is, can you just give us the headline? Can, can you, you bring the most important thing to the surface so that we can understand what we're aiming for? It was interesting, this nuance of, of culture that was taking place, a way of communicating that 
I was missing. And my point was becoming less, less effective because I was burying that lead. How often do we do that with the story of Jesus in our life? I remember growing up in church, I was in a youth gathering once and, and one of the leaders was asked, hey, could you share your testimony? Share the story of what Jesus has done in your life. And so he got up in front of the room and he said, well, let me tell you the story of my life. And for about 40 minutes, he described in great detail, in painstaking, heart-wrenching detail, all of the darkness that his, his past had held, the painful decisions he had made and every consequence that went with them and how it made him feel and how he was certain it made other people feel. And there was, there was some tears and there was some raw emotions. And, and as he was coming near the conclusion, he said, then I met Jesus. Let's pray. Now, hold up. His whole story was focused only on the darkness that he had been brought out of and not on the light that he had brought into. It was all about the death that he had left and, and nothing about the life that he was experiencing. I remember even in those young formative years thinking, I don't want the story of my life to be like that. I don't want the focus of the way I share the gospel story to be all about how bad it would be without Jesus and never to highlight how good it is with Jesus. Hey, do you have a Bible with you? Turn to Nehemiah. I, I know you've probably not been in Nehemiah recently. Turn back to Nehemiah in, in, in chapter 8. I want to show you something about the way that the gospel needs to be shared. Nehemiah chapter 8. In this story, a, a group of people had moved back to the city of Jerusalem. They were rebuilding a wall, trying to reestablish society after uh, they had been annexed out of and, and lost the, the vibrancy of their culture. You could say it was for them after like a lockdown season that had extended for a long time. They were rebuilding economy, rebuilding the wall, rebuilding the temple. And as the people were in this rebuild, the, the prophets and the priests, they began to, to preach the word to them. They read the Bible. It says in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 8, then they read from the book of the law and they made it clear and they gave it meaning so that people could understand what was being read. It's so interesting that they, they didn't just say, now let's begin, open up the Bible, let's start talking. They, they paused and gave it meaning. If you've ever attended Vivid Church, if you're here today, that's what we try to do is not just open up the Bible and, and read it, but to say, can I stop and pause and give it some meaning? Here's what happens when they gave it meaning. The people in just hearing the word had actually been overwhelmed by how dark their life was, overwhelmed by how, how much flaw they had. And it says they began to weep. But then look at this, verse 10, Nehemiah said this, no, 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 go and enjoy choice foods and enjoy sweet drinks and send some of those to the people who have nothing. This is a day that's holy to the Lord. Don't grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And then the Levites, the, the people who were giving it meaning and helping them to understand, they calmed all the people down and they said, be still, this is a holy day, don't grieve. So then all the people went away, they ate and they drank and they sent portions of food and they celebrated with great joy because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. See, that's what it should feel like when people understand the gospel. When we as those who have a story to tell, tell the world it's fruitful no matter when or where. When we are not ashamed of the gospel, but we let it be known that the hope we have comes from Jesus, it brings joy. In fact, it replaces mourning with joy. I really feel like somebody today, you're listening to this and, and you live under a constant condemnation that God's angry with you and you're a failure and you, you've messed up. Maybe you live in this weight like the, the, the person I described growing up in, in youth ministry who was saying, I did all these wrong things and I, I made all these mistakes and I, all this brokenness. And you have not yet entered into the joy that comes in knowing you've been set free. Then, then I pray today is your day. You see, this gospel, it transcends culture. This gospel, it's not just effective in, in one time period or in one culture. Why? Because the, the culture of heaven is different from the cultures we live in. 
One of the things I love about Vivid is it's comprised of people from so many cultures. If you ever gather together, there's accents from all over the world. In fact, often even on the chat in this online format, we see people chatting back and forth in different languages. It's a beautiful thing. It's, it's a little bit what heaven's going to feel like when people from every nation, tribe, and tongue gather together to worship Jesus. But you know, heaven has its own culture, and its culture is not linked to the, the type of food you prefer. It's not linked to favorite sports. It's not linked to climates that you're used to or, or relative humidities. It's not linked to language. Here's the culture of heaven. Let me show you in Second uh, Peter, if you could turn to Second Peter in your Bible. Now, I warned you, I was going all over today. We're doing some, some uh, finger athletics as we make our way through the Bible today. I want you to catch this. I, I think I said Second Peter. Go to First Peter. First Peter, chapter 2, starting at verse 9. Speaking to those who have received the gospel, the good news. God's grace. It says this, but you are a chosen people. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You are God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who's called you out of darkness and into wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Do you catch that? That's the culture of heaven. That, that's the thing that, that binds us together. It's not that we come from different backgrounds. It's not uh, linked to our ethnicity. It's linked to this good news, this great grace. It says, first of all, you're chosen. I don't know if you've ever felt the pain of, of not being chosen. Maybe you felt the pain of rejection that comes with being chosen last or being somebody's second choice. But God chose you. God picked you. You might say, no, 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 I, I made the choice. It's true. You do have an active choice in receiving God's grace, but it was God who made the choice to extend it your way, knowing all of the best and worst things about you and all the best and worst things about me. He chose us. We're a chosen people. There's a certain confidence that comes with knowing you've been picked, that you're wanted, that you're loved. Number two, it says that we're a royal priesthood, both kings and and priests were anointed. Both kings and priests were set apart for the, the incredible task that was at hand. And God says of us that we're both royal and priestly. We have a function before people and a function before God. And because of the anointing on our lives, we actually have the ability and the power to do what we've been called to. God doesn't just shout out from a distance, you're a, you're a prophet, you're a priest, you're a king. He draws near and anoints us and says, you are a royal priesthood. That means you do have the power to accomplish all that God's called you to. He chose you and he's actually set you apart to do all he's called you to. And the third thing it says this is that we're a holy nation. Imagine that if what we were known for as a people of God is holiness. I don't know what Canadians are known for. I guess we're known for, for saying sorry a lot. I guess we're known for, for ending our sentences with A. I think the reason we do that is we're, we so want to have connectedness that we'd say, oh, it's a beautiful day, eh? And if you don't agree, I'll change my statement. I can change my opinion on the day anytime. I just want us to be connected. It's interesting things we're known for as a, a culture. Politeness, poutine, hockey. But here the Bible says this, that those who are called by God, they're known for their holiness. Man, a holiness that's linked to grace, a holiness that's not linked to effort, but linked to the good grace of God. That's why the news of the gospel is so good, that our righteousness gets traded for God's perfection. And then he says this, you are a, a, a people who are God's special possession. Different translations translate this unique word in a different way. I like the King James Version because it says you are a, a peculiar people. I think that's kind of funny. You are peculiar. If you were sitting beside someone right now, I would say, turn to the person beside you and say, you're peculiar. The truth of the matter, is, it means this, that you are like a treasure to God. You're the one that he's chosen. You're the one that he favors above all. You are uniquely chosen and loved and special to God. Another way you could translate it is this, that your life points to God. And with this, I want to ask us, let's make our point. Let's truly make 
our point. Imagine if you were walking down the street. I know for many of you, you haven't walked down a street in a long time, but imagine if you were and, and you came around the corner and someone was just doing this. Wouldn't you be inclined to look to what they were pointing to? Like, wouldn't you probably stop? Maybe, maybe pull over and stop to see what is it that's caught their attention? Well, the Bible says this, that our lives as peculiar people are pointing to Jesus. Our lives are ultimately reflecting the light of Jesus' life for all to see. And if we make a point to Jesus, if we allow our lives to point to him, then others might miss us, but they see him. Others, in other words, will be drawn to the lead of the story, and they might miss some of the periphery. I says the whole purpose for which God called us, his love, his grace extended to us, is not, is not just for our behalf. It's not just salvation to us, but it's also salvation through us. He says, I've called you so that you might declare the praises of him who's called you out of darkness and into light. So let me conclude with this. Number one, God has called you to declaration. He has called you to share that good news. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. It is effective all around the world. Bring meaning to it and it will bring joy to people. Declare that good news. The Bible says in Romans, how would anyone believe unless they hear? And how would anyone hear unless we declare? That word declare means publish. Publish. Don't keep your faith as a private thing. Share the greatest part of your story, the Jesus part of your story, because it has the power of salvation. It has the power to bring joy to everyone who would hear it. So even in this time, and use your social media platform, use your human interactions, engage in a, a phone call with someone you haven't talked to in a while, reach out to a person who's far off and share this incredible good news that God's grace is available to everyone who believes. The second thing I want you to catch is this. It says that we've all been called out of darkness and into light. You know, one of the things I think that holds people back from really sharing the good news of the gospel to being one of those ones who would tell the world is they feel like their, their past is so dark. Well, I want you to get, grab this today. Everyone who has received the grace of God has a very dark past. Everyone. And everyone who has received the grace of God has a very bright future. Our past is dark. Our future is bright. Why? Because of the good news. So let's not let our human interactions be about the periphery, the last few paragraphs that could get cut off the end of any story and no one would ever know. Let's not let all of our human interactions be about you know, how are you doing? Oh man, you know, I wish the weather was better. Let's not live in that space. Let's live as those who publish and declare and proclaim the good news of God's grace because it is the power to save.